There are over 82 million single family homes in America. About 15 million of these homes are rented instead of owner occupied. These houses used to be more affordable. Today, the price of a single family home is over seven times the median income, up from three times the median income in the 1960s. And home prices now exceed the peak of the 2008 bubble. Only this time, the home builders are fewer and the investors are larger. Private equity firms took notice and started buying single family homes. How does the practice of investment firms buying single family homes impact housing prices? Are these investment firms causing the housing crisis? I'm Dominic, I'm a city planner. If you're interested in cities, economics, and planning, subscribe for more videos. To simplify, let's characterize home buyers into two categories, an investor, someone buying the house to rent at a profit, and a homeowner, someone buying the house to live in and make their home. There are different sizes of investors, so let's first focus on mega investors, owning 1,000 homes or more. As home prices crashed in 2008, private equity firms started buying up single-family homes that were foreclosed on and rented them out instead of reselling them. Since the financial crisis, rents and home prices have steadily increased, and so have the investment firms buying these homes. There are about 82 million single-family homes in America. About 15.1 million of these single-family homes are rented out but only 3% of these 15 million homes are owned by mega institutions. Most of the ownership is by medium investors who own less than 100 properties, not Wall Street investment funds. So it doesn't seem private equity firms have bought enough houses to move the market, unless you live in a city where they are heavily invested, like Atlanta. Atlanta has 72,000 single family homes owned by mega operators. Phoenix has 33,000, Dallas 27,000, Charlotte and Houston, 24,000, and Tampa has 23,000. Mega operators are choosing fast-growing cities that are experiencing significant rental increases. In Atlanta, mega institutions own 10% of all rental properties and almost 29% of all single-family home rentals. Who are these mega institutions? Two of the country's largest landlords of single-family homes are Invitation Homes and American Homes for Rent. Their taglines are, live freer, lease a house, and home, simplified. Invitation Homes was founded by Blackstone Inc. in 2012, one of the largest private equity firms in the U.S. Both are publicly traded real estate investment trusts, meaning you can invest in them too. REITs raise money from investors, which they use to buy, manage, and finance real estate. They then collect rent from tenants to distribute the earnings to shareholders. Look at how many homes they own in Atlanta, Georgia in Tampa, Florida. They even offer rental bundles for an extra $60 a month that include internet and a doorbell camera. So how are they as landlords? The Federal Trade Commission actually took action against invitation homes for deceiving renters, charging junk fees, failing to inspect homes before residents moved in, and unfairly withholding tenants' security deposits after moving out. Invitation Homes has agreed to a proposed settlement order that would require them to pay $48 million to refund consumers harmed by their actions. According to the FTC, renters would be charged mandatory fees after paying a non-refundable application fee. And sometimes, these mandatory fees weren't known until after signing the lease. But having more single-family homes to rent has its benefits. One benefit to the rise in single-family homes being built for rent is that some families are now able to live in a better neighborhood they otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford. Some families who can't afford to buy into a neighborhood with a good school district may be able to afford to rent there. That's because buying requires a down payment, possibly a higher monthly payment, and annual maintenance costs. So some people may prefer to rent instead of own. Another benefit is that these single family homes for rent don't seem to be taking homes off the market for lower income families. They are occupied more by higher income families that are choosing not to own. An additional benefit is that sellers are being paid in cash, so they're able to have quicker transactions than waiting for an individual to obtain financing. Then there's the other scenario, a buyer purchasing a house to live in themselves. This house is bought as a shelter, security, and a place to live. How did such a sacred place become a financial product coveted by Wall Street? Why are first-time home buyers competing with some of the largest financial institutions in America? Well, it's because it pays. 
Between January 2020 and January 2023, rents for a two-bedroom single-family home increased 44% in Tampa, 43% in Phoenix, and 35% near Atlanta. That's more than double the S&P 500's return over the same time period. But it's not just Wall Street who benefits from rising rents and rising home prices. Existing homeowners do too, as well as the government, banks, insurance companies, and the mortgage industry. Historically, buying a home and letting it appreciate over time has been one of the most significant investment vehicles for most Americans. So, in many ways, the individual homeowner treats housing as an investment just like Wall Street does, and advocates for policies that increase the value of their home. Those who don't benefit from rising housing prices are renters and first-time home buyers. If these mega companies are building and renting out thousands of new single-family homes, why are rents and housing prices still going up? It's because real estate is different from other products. A place can be a monopoly because you can't make more land. As more money is invested in land to build more homes, the more valuable the surrounding land becomes. Investment in more units in public infrastructure is a signal that this place has value, driving up the price of that property and surrounding properties. Private equity firms building and buying single-family homes are actually a lagging indicator. They are more chasing the higher rents than they are initiating them. So housing prices aren't just a simple function of a local market's housing supply, because demand can shift rapidly based on regional changes. For example, suburbs in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island are impacted by Boston's employment and housing production. Now that more people can work from home, people can live further away from centers of employment and commerce. If Boston doesn't build housing, but continues to create high paying jobs, it puts upward pressure on housing prices in the surrounding suburbs. Arizona is an example of a state building a lot of housing, but one that is still experiencing increasing housing prices. That's because Arizona is impacted by increased demand from people moving there from California and New England. There's also been a significant lack of housing supply built after the 2008 financial crisis. So there was room in the market for more houses and apartments to be built while prices continued to rise. But this doesn't mean housing is immune from local supply and demand. Austin, Texas is a good example of increased housing supply resulting in a reduction of rents. Austin's population increased by over half a million people over the past decade, but they also built a lot of housing to accommodate this growth. Austin built almost 13,000 new apartments in 2022 alone. In 2023, rents started to drop. Austin got rid of parking requirements and allowed up to three units to be built on a parcel where only one or two were allowed before. San Francisco, on the other hand, hasn't been building much housing. In 2016, San Francisco Bay permitted one new housing unit for every 13 new jobs. Demand clearly outpaced supply, driving prices up. So if banning private equity firms from buying single-family homes doesn't fix the problem, how can single-family homes become more affordable? In the long run, creating a local housing market less correlated with the boom and bust of national markets will help the local market adapt to meet local needs. Increased housing supply seems to be an obvious solution, but a goal should also be to increase access to those who can build and add to the supply. Some cities have allowed increased density in a variety of ways by allowing duplexes and accessory dwelling units. Allowing incremental growth this way allows the smaller individual investors to add housing units to the local market incrementally, instead of relying on national home builders carving out 100 house subdivisions. The bar for entry to participate in adding new housing units has become so high that only a few home building corporations can participate. It results in fewer local builders and local housing construction being more reliant on national capital markets. Increased housing types will also help first-time homebuyers. Many cities and towns don't allow townhomes. They only allow single-family homes on large lots. This prices out so many first-time homebuyers who want to own, but don't want a half-acre parcel to maintain. Diversifying housing types to meet the market's demand will go a long way at providing opportunities for entry-level housing. Banning corporations from buying single-family homes wouldn't result in any significant change especially when they are some of the ones actually adding to the housing supply, albeit building to rent. If you're interested in the housing market and why it's become so expensive, 
I highly recommend reading Escaping the Housing Trap by Chuck Marone. A link to buy it is in this video's description. This book goes into depth on the evolution of how housing has been created, regulated, and financed, and why we are in a cyclical housing trap of booms followed by busts.